Okay. Well, welcome everyone. Thanks um, for coming out in force today for what a uh, lecture that I'm very much looking forward to. In welcoming you, I do want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, Eunice W's built on uh, Bidjigal country. The Bidjigal people lived there for generations and still are there. And uh, we have the Ngunnawal people in Canberra and the Gadigal people uh, down in Paddington. And you may be coming from all different um, indigenous countries across Australia. So terrific to be here. Um, it's the Scientia uh, Academy lecture. Uh, the Scientia Education Academy was basically formed to get our most inspirational teachers who had extraordinary experience and held the respect of the community together so they could have more of an influence. And it's we've got about 50 people admitted to the Scientia Education Academy. And I think it has transformed the way we do things here at UNSW. It's a terrific group of people. Um, every now and then we welcome new uh, members into the academy. The influence is good and it's provided a forum for us to share best practice in, in teaching and learning. And that is something that's so easy to share because while people's research focuses will often tend to be very narrow, the challenges that we have in teaching are shared by all of us and there are many things in common. And I'll just say that I'm absolutely des delighted that we've got Jason here with us today because he's one of the thought leaders in this area and a very sensible thought leader because there's a lot of, um, there's a great range of views out here, but I've listened to Jason's work or read his work for a while and, and it's very good. So we're delighted to have him. But I won't say anything more about that. I'll introduce Professor Patsy Polly. Uh, Patsy is the director of the Scientia Education Academy and uh, a professor in medical sciences here. So I'll go on mute. I'll turn off my camera to hide and I'll hand over to you, Patsy. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Merlin, and thank you for that brief introduction of Jason. I met Jason at Herzer this year, and it was a great pleasure to meet you in person, Jason. So Jason is an associate professor, associate professor Jason Lodge, who has a PhD um, in, uh, and he's an associate professor in educational psychology and director of learning instruction and technology lab in the School of Education, and is a dean the Dean, Associate Dean Academic in the Faculties of Hu Faculty of Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences at the University of Queensland. So Jason's research uh, with his lab focuses on cognitive, metacognitive and emotional mechanisms of learning, mm -hmm. primarily in post-secondary settings and in digital learning environments. Jason currently serves as lead editor of Australasian Journal of Educational Technology and the editor of Student Success. And it was our great pleasure to host Jason as a visiting teaching fellow last year. He was hosted by associate lecturer, Helena Pachiti. And I believe Jason, you could have been one of the first visiting teaching fellows at UNSW. So welcome back again. It's with great pleasure that we host you as part of our uh, Scientia Education Academy lecture series. Over to you, Jason. Thank you, Patsy, and thank you, Merlin. I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully you can all see that okay. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, I did do the visiting teaching fellow last year and it was a fabulous experience. So thank you for that. Um, and it's a pleasure to be able to join you today to talk about this uh, hopefully timely topic. I will start by acknowledging that I am currently in Mianjin on the Maywa and I wish to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of this land and pay my respects to ancestors and descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connection to country. Obviously a very important week for acknowledging our um, Indigenous and Torres Strait Islander colleagues. So some of you may have picked up on the title here that there is a bit of a play on um, there and back again, The Hobbit's Tale. And partly in my mind, I wanted to try and tell a bit of a story about the journey that we've all been on this year. Um, but somehow in the process, it didn't quite feel like the Hobbit's journey was the right fit for this. Um, it is mid-October, so we know that this is usually the time of year where you all start to get a bit tired and look forward to a bit of a break at Christmas. 
So while this is a sometimes heavy topic that we need to consider, I wanted to give it a slightly lighter feel. And with that, I apologize both to George Lucas and to any of you, particularly those of you who are not familiar with science fiction. Some of my references here are going to go past you and I apologize for that. There is a serious component to what I'm going to talk about. With that said, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, or alternatively, not that long ago in a university very nearby for all of us. At the beginning of the year, a certain menace emerged, I think it's fair to say. And for many of us, this was a surprise. I think it felt like it came out of nowhere. I'll talk a little bit in a minute about some of the work that we've been doing prior to the emergence of ChatGPT. Uh, but I think even those of us who were working in this space were a little surprised that the tools that we now have available were available so rapidly and so in such a widespread way without any cost. For a lot of these things, um, it really is uh, the case that there is usually a slow release, you know, people get access beforehand, things are very expensive. If you think about a lot of the technologies that have been available in the past, that has often been the case. You know, the small group of people get around to, to play with these things and then the, the access to these tools spreads. This was different. Everybody had it, everybody had it straight away and um, we were then able to see what the impact of that was. So we had our menace on the horizon. At this point, some of you may realize that I have been using Midjourney quite a lot to generate images. Uh, it's getting better all the time. This is amazing. I, I generated this image. It's never been created before. Uh, and it took me about three seconds and then about 10 seconds of, of generating time in Midjourney for it to appear, which I think is qu also quite incredible. I don't claim to have any um, talent or creative expertise whatsoever, but you know that's a passable image, I think, to try and get across that we have a new threat here that we're dealing with um there was a war apparently in some quarters that schools were declaring war against these new tools um and we are here talking about large language models like chat gpt bard and bing um if you were thinking we were going to be talking about something else here sorry uh, i'm not going to give you the, the big introduction to large language models hopefully you've got a sense of that by now but when they emerged this was the initial response in a lot of different places um my favorite early story though from the beginning of the year was this instance where there was a report of a student using ChatGPT to cheat on an AI ethics class. Now, there are a few things not working there, I think, in a number of different directions. But again, I think it partly points to some of the issues that I'm going to walk us through today. The response in many jurisdictions was obviously to say, look, these things are banned. Um, as it stands, I'm not going to speak for the other states, but certainly in Queensland, the official position in Queensland public schools is... ChatGPT and similar large language model based generative AI tools are still banned at this point. So we did have this menace emerge and there was a pretty rapid and quite blunt response to that in many jurisdictions that still stands to today. Oops. Sorry, a bit of echo in the background there. Uh, one of the other things that happened early on is that uh, people became AI experts very quickly. In fact, faster than the speed of light in some cases. Uh, and I think that's probably fair enough. In my defense, I will say a couple of things here. One is I'm not a computer scientist. Um, as Patsy said in her introduction, my background is educational psychology. So I don't claim to be a computer scientist here. I can't give you the in and out details of how to create an algorithm or a large language model from scratch. What I have been doing though, is um, thinking about human computer interaction and this is work that i've been doing way back when i was an undergraduate which i'm not going to mention which decade that was where we were using chatbot tools like eliza here that's been around since the 1960s but we were using it as a way to understand how the brain worked because the idea sitting underneath all of these is around this idea of a neural network so i have some sense conceptually of what these things are but i again i don't claim to be a computer scientist I think we've reached the point now where Martin Weller, who's very respected in the educational technology space, is calling this current moment the grifter's paradise because of some of the weird ideas that are out there that people are, are perpetuating because they see an opportunity in this, in this particular area. Again, in my defense, we were working on the issues around assessment and artificial intelligence. This article just happened to come out in November, the same month as ChatGPT was released where we started to map out what some of the major issues were with these emerging technologies and what we need to then think about. 
we also put it in a center of excellence where we were told where we were told over and over again that AI and education wasn't going to be a problem. Whoops. Uh, no, needless to say, we didn't. Uh, we weren't successful in that center of excellence bid. One thing I would recommend for anybody who is in the kind of in between space like I am, who's sort of interested in this stuff but is not a computer scientist, I think Stephen Wolfram's very short book, which started off as a blog post, "What is ChatGPT doing? ChatGPT doing, and why does it work?" was really helpful for me to get a sense of what we're really grappling with here. I thought that was such a great way of capturing it. It's short, sharp, gets to the point. If you feel like you'd like to know more about this, I can certainly kind of recommend that for a sort of non-technical but quite conceptual way of, of understanding what we're grappling with here. So those were some of the early movements that we saw in the first act here or in our first episode. Uh, towards the end of this, we saw some sort of major global reports come out like this one from UNESCO that started to paint a more complex and nuanced picture of what we were really dealing with here. I think a lot of the fear initially was that students would take an assessment task, plug it into ChatGPT, get an output, submit that output, and go about their day. But very quickly, it became evident in this report and in other places, and I know Mike Sharple's work from the UK has been focused on this a lot, that there are all sorts of amazing ways that we can start to use these technologies as part of the learning process to produce possibilities as a way of you know, operating as a personal tutor, as a study buddy or a motivator. And the data that we've been collecting this year is certainly showing us that students are selectively using this technology within a network of collaborations with peers, with teachers, with Google. Google still remains part of um, the, the, the kind of network that they navigate here to work their way through trying to understand what it is that they need to understand. So students very quickly managed to figure out how to integrate this into what the, what they do and found ways in which this was really effective for them relative to the other ways that they get help with their learning. Um, and we've had a lot of students tell us, we've been doing hour long interviews with them to really try and get into the, the nitty gritty of, of how they're using this technology. And that's what they're telling us. It's a, it's a trade off of different things that they're gonna selectively use. I think Danny Liu at the University of Sydney has also been really good at capturing this early phase. This post is from a couple of months ago, but I think it does a really great job of, of kind of summarising that early sense making that we all collectively went through. So if we want to revisit the one of the prequels that we were grappling with earlier on, I think that's a good summary of the ideas that were around and how we'd started to evolve from there. The core of the issue for us and the one that we're still grappling with, so even though a lot of this has disappeared from the headlines, this is still a problem for us. The artifacts that we have often relied on to make inferences about student work and therefore student learning and the journey that they've gone on can be produced without that work actually occurring. So this, I think, is really the core of what we're looking at. The inferences that we might make on the basis of an artifact are now threatened. Right? And if we think of that from a cheating perspective, which I think is one way of doing it, it's not the only way. The opportunities are everywhere and you basically require no means. Whereas opportunities were more difficult before, even if you think about something like contract cheating, yes, they're advertising everywhere, but it still required us to go further than just having it embedded within the tools that we use. And it doesn't really cost anything anymore. So this I think paints the picture of the issue that we have that continues beyond that, that first phase of the, the hype that we had around all of this. Which brings us to episode two, and I've called this one the revenge of the exam. And here's, here's how I think this one fits in. We've started to see an escalation in the difficulty that we have with grappling with these new technologies, firstly, because it's gonna be everywhere. We're already seeing it embedded within the Microsoft products. Google is not far behind. Other tech vendors are thinking about this. And these are products that we use, that our students use every day for productivity, for learning and so on. So not only do you not need to go anywhere anymore, it's deeply embedded within the tools that we're already using, right? So this ups the ante, I think. Secondly, I think there was a lot of talk about our ability to be able to detect the use of these tools early on. That is increasingly questionable. I'm gonna be careful about how I frame this, but I think it's fair to say that there is plenty of data out there saying that this is a, extremely challenging to be able to detect whether students have actually used these tools or not. Beyond, our ability, there is also the other side, which is the kind of supply and demand equation here, that you can already find hundreds, literally hundreds of videos on YouTube that will step students through one step at a time how they can get around any AI detector that's currently out there. 
and this is YouTube, right? This is not a dark web thing. This is, you know, right there. It doesn't take much effort to be able to find this stuff. So the reaction to that in some quarters has been, well, we need to really emphasize pen and paper exams um, in this bastion of journalism that we find ourselves looking at here. This is a story from a few weeks ago where the argument was that pen and paper exams are really a key element in all of this. I don't fully disagree with that. Um, and here's why. We tried to map out the options a couple of months ago. Some of you might have seen um, this floating around. And we thought about short, medium and long term. What are the core options we've got on the table here? It seems like we can't ignore this, right? The genie's out of the bottle. Uh, can't can't just pretend this is not going to be a thing. It's not going to be like electronic whiteboards where they're parked in corners collecting dust. This is fundamentally changing the interaction that we have with information, uh, I think, is fair to say. Um, I could be convinced otherwise. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but people who have been doing this a lot longer than I have are also saying the same thing. So ignoring, banning, as we've already talked about, is tricky. Uh, so perhaps that's not the way to go here. If we're talking about pen and paper exams, well, there are certainly going to be places where that is already appropriate and places where that will continue to be appropriate. We need to be certain that students have some idea of what it is that they know before they go out and start operating on people, for example. So there are quite a few instances where exams have been appropriate in the past and will continue to be, I think. Embracing, I'm going to talk about that quite a bit shortly. I think that's something we need to consider. Designing around it, by this I mean some of the weaknesses that were evident early on because the information was often being harvested from the internet and we know a lot of the stuff on the internet is questionable, shall we say. Um, that was looking viable at the beginning of the year. Having put some of my own assessments through this, I thought I could get away with it at the beginning of the year, but as soon as GPT-4 came along, that was no longer an option. It did a much better job. There were no, not the same level of factual areas in it as there were previously. So it kind of left us with either embracing this, using invigilated approaches where appropriate, or rethinking some of the assessment approaches that we've traditionally used. This is where the Commonwealth strikes back. So while all of this has been happening in the background, um, some of you will be familiar with this. We have had the development of a national framework for generative AI intelligence, well, generative artificial intelligence in schools. Uh, that was endorsed by the ministers last week. I haven't seen the final version. I did get to, to have some input and was part of the initial discussions in putting that together. So even though it's focused on schools, it is certainly a conversation that many of us in higher ed have been involved in as well. So there is a lot of crossover there. There is also the inquiry into generative artificial intelligence in the Australian education system, and that is broad, less so about early childhood, but certainly about K-12, certainly about higher ed, and definitely also about vocational education as well. So strong emphasis here. So the government has been quite active in this space, the federal government and the state governments. Um, hence the Commonwealth strikes back. We're also seeing some more nuanced work coming out internationally from UNESCO and in other places. What I think this work has done a really great job of is setting the foundation here in terms of these aspects. What do we need to consider around privacy, equity, transparency, who owns the data, the kinds of biases that we see in these large language models. These are absolutely fundamental, critical issues that we need to consider here. So Please don't take anything that I'm about to say after this to say, we don't need to focus on these things because there's other things we need to look at. We need this as a foundation. However, we also need to think about what this is going to look like because even the final lot of bans will be lifted in schools in term one next year. This is everywhere. And this is something that all of our education sectors need to grapple with, including us in higher ed, of course. What worries me a little bit is that in all of this documentation and all of this work that's happening with, at the Commonwealth level and internationally, the question about how we teach, learn and assess with AI is still largely left open. So if you look at the national framework, for example, at least the draft version that was circulated a couple of months ago, there are two short paragraphs that deal with anything to do with assessment or teaching or learning. And it probably says a lot about the state of our understanding of how these technologies are going to impact on these things going forward. Worryingly for me, as somebody who works in educational psychology, is that learning is also quite absent. Um, and beyond that, I look at the university's accord. Learning is mentioned on 73 pages. I double-checked. 
And in every one of those mentions, it is a generic mention of learning and teaching, which then immediately starts talking about teaching, or it refers to things like active learning, which is really a, a pedagogical approach, frankly, rather than about the developmental process that students go through over time. So in this guiding document that is setting us for the future, in 150 pages of it, it doesn't actually talk about what I see as the core business of what we do in higher education at all. So there's a bit of a trend, I think, here emerging that we've got a lot of issues that we're grappling with, but assessment, teaching, learning sometimes slip through the cracks. As a result, those gaps are being filled by conversations like this. I've got all respect for Stuart Russell. He is an amazing, you know, godparent of artificial intelligence, literally wrote the textbook. He has no idea what he's talking about when it comes to education. Classrooms are not going to cease to exist because learning is relational. It's not a transaction. Teachers are critical and perhaps more critical now that we have AI than, than less so. And even beyond that, some of the, you know, trumpeting of this new age of AI, for example, from Bill Gates, immediately launches into AI, how AI can be used to cater for individual learning styles. And I don't, I don't mean to break this to any of you who are not familiar with this work, but this was debunked well over a decade ago. <laughs> the idea that we should be catering for modality-based preferences is, is nonsense. So the gap that is being left in the discussion about learning is being filled by some of these weird ideas that are out there that don't align with the, the evidence that we've got, which makes me worry about what kind of hellscape we might expect in the future here. I don't want us to have one of these dystopian futures. So that's why I'm trying to say we need to have more nuanced conversations about assessment and learning in all of this. And hopefully this is where our episode four, a new hope question mark might fit in here. We were fortunate enough that um, Texa was prepared to support a number of us to get together in August uh, in Sydney. Now, these are experts around the country in artificial intelligence. So there were some people who had that technical expertise, experts in assessment, experts in uh, learning, and experts more broadly in higher education and across a range of different roles. And we had a deputy vice chancellor in the room. You know, we had researchers in the room, but the idea was to bring together this expertise and work through what is it really that we're grappling with here and how can we help to kind of set a direction about where we need to go. Some of you will be familiar that the uh, report that or the resource that we produced on the basis of that was released a couple of weeks ago. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about this specifically, but I think there are a couple of things that I would say. One is that I think this was an amazing opportunity and we're very grateful to Texa for providing this. Secondly, what we were really mindful of that is that this was as collaborative as possible. So the document itself went out to another 60 people after the 20 that were in the room. Um, 40 or so, including Merlin, thank you, um, gave us feedback on the document, which then we then integrated into it. So part of what we're thinking here is that this could be a model for the kind of collaboration that could help us adapt to the sorts of things that we might expect that the Accord will provide us as Christmas presents. You know, it was collaborative. We built on evidence. And what we wanted to try and do is say, look, we can't map the future here. Things are changing. Things are evolving. But what we hope to do was provide a compass. So at least we know which direction we might head in. So that at a high level is what we're thinking about in terms of assessment. We did have a webinar a couple of weeks ago, if you missed it and want to get more of a feel about what we did and why the YouTube of that is now posted. Uh, one of the things we were very careful to say is that as far as assessment goes, there were some very important messages that were communicated by David Bowd and colleagues back in 2010. They hold. And we think that at the core of what we're considering around any assessment changes that we might make as a result of generative AI, that those principles are actually still a really good starting point. And if we had have achieved the aspirations that were in that document from 2010, maybe we wouldn't be in the situation that we're in now. So the first thing I would say is that when it comes to assessment, we already know what good assessment design looks like and we have a great resource there as a starting point. From there, we have a couple of guiding principles. We wanna be able to set students up for a world where AI is a thing where the genie is out of the bottle, as we've talked about. We also want to make sure that at points through their degree experience or whatever the credential is that we're talking about, that we are certain that we can trust the judgments we're making about students' progress on the basis of that assessment. All right. Then from there, we have five propositions. As I said, I'm not going to spend a lot of time unpacking these. We've done that elsewhere. Um, 
appropriate, authentic engagement with AI, that we need to take a systematic or systemic and programmatic view that each assessment task doesn't exist in a vacuum. We need to get serious about thinking about the learning process. I'm going to think, I'm going to pick up on that theme a little bit more here. We need to think about the relationship the students have with us, with each other, and with technology together, which is what that one about working appropriately with each other and AI is about. And then finally, the one that I think we need to consider um, as an acute problem is that we need to have points across the program where we can be absolutely certain that the student in front of us, physically or virtually, is the student who's gone through the process, has produced the work, and is meeting the outcomes that we're looking for. So I want to park that momentarily. I think together as a sector, we have work to do in the months and years ahead to figure out how that's going to happen. That's not going to be easy. You know, we've gone through a period where we've had a pandemic, we've had changes, we've got a university accord happening, we don't know what's going to come out of that yet, right? So there are a whole lot of moving pieces here, um, but we do absolutely be, need to be careful that we can hand on heart say that the credentials that we're handing out are valuable and point to something about what students have learned and been able to achieve. So that is our immediate challenge, I think, and given that we were working with Texa on this and their risk-based approach, probably not surprising that that's a really key emphasis and it has to be. All right, so let's park that for a moment. That's work we're gonna to continue to, to unpack and, and figure out how we're gonna do that together. But I wanted to focus on one other part here because I think this is important for where we go to next. And this is our episode five, The Future Awakens. So where do we go now? We're gonna work on this idea of risk. We're gonna come up with secure ways of being at least fairly certain that the students are doing the work. But what else do we need to consider here? The one I haven't touched a lot on is this one. How do we embrace this? What, is it, what does it mean if we're preparing students for a world where AI is the thing, where the genie is out of the bottle? Part of that is about the assessment, but part of that is more broadly about the curriculum, right? And it has to be, those things need to work together. So it raises the question about learning and learning processes again. And this is something that we've tried to think about over the last few months. Uh, so work that I've been doing with my postdoc, Su Jing, Leon Furs and Philip Dawson, who are both from Deakin. What we were trying to do here is to think about moving beyond this idea that AI just serves as a calculator, uh, because the sorts of changes that we need to think about making are different, I think it's fair to say, than when the calculator was introduced. Some elements are similar, right? but I think what we're seeing in terms of the relationships that students have with these technologies, indeed the relationships that we have with these technologies, suggests that there is something more going on here. So we've tried to categorize this. No map is perfect. We hope that this one's useful though. No map or model is perfect. We hope that this one might be useful. At one end, we've got this idea that we can offload the calculation to a calculator, does a great job of it, gives us back some output and away we go. We think about what that might, be, might look like when we extend our capabilities. You can think about something like a mobile phone where we're able to do things with that that take our own innate capabilities. Think about memory, for example, limited capacity for that. How can we extend that using our phone? Right? I don't remember anybody's phone numbers anymore. I barely remember my own phone number. Don't need to. I can extend my memory by putting it into the machine. But it is an extension as opposed to just completely offloading. But right? I'm not offloading my entire memory to the machine. There's still stuff in there that I can draw on. Now, if we think about the newer possibilities that we're seeing, and this is what students are telling us. So again, we're drawing on the data from the interviews that we're doing and other data that we've got. There is increasingly a co-regulatory capacity that AI is serving where students are testing themselves. And you can see threads of this in Mike Sharple's work and the, um, the report that came out from UNESCO, that it's starting to work more like a study buddy, right? So that a study buddy indicates something far more than a calculator or a phone. It's much more interactive. It's a two-way thing. I'm not entirely comfortable with the idea that a large language model or even an interface like ChatGPT has agency that opens up a whole can of worms that I don't want to go into, but there certainly seems to be a much more interactive uh, dynamic occurring there, which could, if we think about how we extend our own capabilities and our own social capabilities, could become a genuine hybrid relationship between us and machines that is able to produce something far beyond what either could do on their own. Have we reached that possibility yet? I don't know. But I think that it opens up some interesting questions about what learning 
might be in the not too distant future. Inga Molinar in the Netherlands has also been thinking about this question where at one end, we've got things that are all human. At the other end, we've got things that are all machine. When we have this hybrid relationship in the middle, what does that look like? What are the possibilities there? Are we really thinking about that? Are we prepared for that? Um, and I, I think that's an interesting question for us to grapple with because I, I'm getting a sense that it's only a, a matter of time before we start to realise some of these possibilities. So how do we build a, a kind of curriculum and therefore an assessment approach that takes this new reality that we're finding ourselves in seriously? And it goes back to one of the key guiding principles that we have in that text document, which is how do assessment and learning experiences really equip students for this reality? And how, do we, how do we help our students get there when we might have these hybrid relationships more, more often? I like to go back to some of the core work on curriculum. Um, this is one of my favourites all time, uh, Sharon Fraser and Agnes Bosenkett, who's a colleague of mine from way back. I think we need to think about curriculum in the in the broadest possible sense. We're not just talking about syllabus here, although as we'll talk about in a second, that's some of the early work in this space is to think about how we might integrate content into a syllabus to, to manage this. But beyond that, what are some of the key ways that we consider what's in our units or subjects? What how do that how does that relate to a whole program of study? What are the connectors there? And you can see the importance there for assessment at a programmatic level. What are the students experiences of learning that they have with us? How do those experiences help to set them up for the world where AI is, is everywhere? And then what does it mean for the dynamic process that us as educators have with students, that students have with each other, and that they have with the syllabus and where we need them to get in terms of their outcomes? So when I'm thinking about curriculum here, I'm thinking about it in that much broader sense. And to me, I think that there are questions across each of these four categories about things that we might need to reconsider in a world where we now have AI at, at the tip of it, our fingers in the core productivity tools that we use day to day. I'm not sure we have clear answers to these things yet, right? Um, we will need to figure them out. And I think that that is gonna take a lot of collective effort over the years ahead. My worry is that that effort will be taken away from us and that the answers will be given to us by technology companies and others. But I'm hoping that you know by us having these conversations and us being able to, to think about this stuff that we can start to drive the agenda and make sure that we're doing these things for the right reasons for us and for our students. So some of this, the, the recent work that's discussing what an AI kind of, or an AI relevant curriculum might look like is talking about some of these kinds of elements. And I think that they're important, right? What does it mean to enable AI? AI how much do we need to know and understand the tools themselves? Uh, how do we use and apply these tools in an appropriate way? How do we evaluate the output of them? And what are the ethics associated with using these tools? And what do we know about the data that's within them and the inherent biases and so on? I think this is a good starting point. Right? And I think if we start to think seriously about the different ways in which these areas will impact on each of our disciplines and each of our subjects or units of study, that's a good starting point. It, does raise a bit of a question about what do we mean by AI literacy? Um, I often ask the question about how far we need to go with this. I can drive a car. I don't need to know the intricate details of the fuel injection system in order to do that. What do we mean by AI literacy here? I think these sorts of things make sense to me. But the second one, I have some questions about how far down the, the rabbit hole we need students to be able to go on this stuff. So again, I think we've got a bit to sort out as far as these and how we integrate them in go. The other area where I think there has been an enormous amount of discussion and one that I've got a lot of interest myself in moves back more into to my territory rather than the AI literacy component of this is, is what do we know about critical thinking? Uh, I have, and Patsy, I can't remember whether you were in my session, but I did do a, a session at Hertzer about unpicking this particular element of the equation. All of our institutions say, and it's often the first one or two of the outcomes or graduate attributes or whatever we call them, we all have different labels for these things that we say that our graduates have when they leave our institutions. But I think there are as many definitions of this term as there are institutions who are saying that their, their students have this as a graduate outcome. So whether or not we're prepared for this being something that we're going to emphasize even more now or not remains an open question. 
It's something that we've been testing systematically here at the university. We have a, a fabulous group of colleagues in our philosophy department here at the University of Queensland who run a critical thinking project. They have been deeply immersed in the ideas of critical thinking for many, many, many years. And using some of their work, we've been systematically testing the different large language models and generative AI tools that are out there to see what their capabilities are across the different ways of understanding what critical thinking is. I know you can't see the text there and I'm breaking my own rule about how to use PowerPoint well, um, but what I wanted to give you a sense of in showing you this matrix is that I, I really appreciate the work that my colleagues are doing because they've taken this notion of critical thinking and systematically broken it down into these elements that are core to what we understand critical thinking to be and then thinking what that might look like at different levels of analysis or different levels of thinking, which has then been translated into different ways about thinking what that looks like for a primary school student or a secondary school student or a senior secondary student or a higher education student. So I really like the systematic and programmatic way that they've broken this down. And I can, you know, if you're interested in this space, I can encourage you to, to have a look at the, if you just go UQ critical thinking project, you'll find um, these resources that help to unpack this. My point here is that what I wanted to get to is that we can start to see some clear differentiation in the things that generative AI, I don't want to say does well, it simulates well, because whether it actually does it or not is a separate question. It simulates these things well, but there are other things that it doesn't do a very good job of at all. Now, these are not weaknesses of the, mach of the machine or the fact of the, you know, the kind of data that's in it or anything like that. These are, I think, important differentiators between the capabilities of a large language model, the capabilities of AI as we currently understand it, and the capabilities of humans. Now, if we're talking about interpretation and analysis, particularly with now with the code interpreter inv available, if you've got the paid version of, of ChatGPT, they've got us covered every day of the week. I think the, the horse is bolted on that. Again, are they actually interpreting? Are they actually analyzing? Probably not, but they do a pretty good job of simulating it. Right, so we're kind of beaten on that front. Similar sort of thing, if you want an explanation of something, you know, actually ChatGPT does a pretty good job of explaining things. Right? It's not always going to get it right, but it's much better than it used to be, and it gets it right most of the time. Now, particularly if you start to connect it to things like Wolfram Alpha, which is coded with accuracy rather than size and speed, then you start to see a much more nuanced way in which things can be explained really well using these tools. And that's part of the reason why I think Khan Academy is going down that path of hooking these things together. On the other hand, if we want to make some sort of evaluation, particularly if it's an evaluation of something that has social, emotional, human type elements, there is no way the machines can do that in the way that we do. Right? Can they simulate it? Can they pretend? Sure. Is that a kind of useful thing for our students who are going to graduate into a world of humans? That is a social world. We haven't quite got to that world of surrogates yet. I don't know if anybody remembers that movie where everybody just stayed home and sent their robot out to do everything, right? We're not there. So as long as students are going to that social world, I think we're covered there. Getting meaning, I think still is our domain because again, this is a social and human world that we live in. So how we make inferences and provide meaning to stuff still sits with us. And self-regulation, I think fairly obviously because it's about the self. All right? So this side of the the sort of broader sense of critical thinking and the things that contribute to critical thinking. Whenever we embed a, a person, a self in that scenario, then inevitably that is something that we'll, we are going to have domain over the machines in that regard. Will this change in a year, in five years or 10 years? Possibly, but at least at this point, when we think about the different elements of critical thinking, some still seem to be us on top, but some of them increasingly seem more like the things that machines are more capable of at least simulating. Partly this is not surprising because some of the sorts of things that we see, particularly around analysis, are often rule-based. Well, guess what? Machines are pretty good at rule-based stuff, right? So where I think we probably need to focus our efforts, and this is my thinking of the journey that we've had so far through our various different episodes, is that the self plays a key role here. Um, George Siemens has been saying a lot over the last year. Many of you will be familiar with, with George Siemens. He, in, he invented MOOCs, um, you know, has been doing educational technology for a long time. And he's been saying that it's it really is about being and our being. 
So the way I interpret this is that the way that education has traditionally operated for a long time is that we've been focused on epistemology. It's about knowing things. It's about having these things in our mind and it's about meeting these outcomes that show that we know stuff. We probably need to still do that. There is absolutely still going to be a role for that. Right? I teach teachers. They will operate in the classroom in the future. The research suggests that they, make to, they need to make 1200, between 1,200 and 1,500 decisions a day in that classroom. Good luck looking all of those up on chat GPT and managing 35 you know year nine students no chance right so they still need to have that core of knowledge there so there is still a part of that but increasingly we're going to have to concentrate more on for my students what does it mean to be a teacher what does it mean to enact that knowledge in the world again we've done that sort of thing in the past but I'm seeing the scales tip from knowing things and knowledge to what does it mean to be the ontological component of this? What does it mean to be this thing? Who better to be able to demonstrate that to students than us? Right? We we have gone through that journey. The value that we bring is that we are humans in the world and we can show how to demonstrate and how to use that knowledge in a real way in a human social world. The other side of that inevitably means that we also need to think about the self-regulated learning piece in this. Right? So what does it mean to be ourself in that situation? How do we navigate that in environment? Um, one of my other rants um, that I won't expose you to today is that we have kind of neglected this idea of self-regulated learning. Um, there have been a lot of things that we've had to focus on, I think it's fair to say, for some period of time. But what I'm seeing is a, a, a kind of shift in and a growing divide between the sorts of things that happen in senior secondary where things are becoming more structured. We want to get our students a good ATAR. We do a very structured process because there are, there's a heavy emphasis on external exams. I'm going to come to university and what have we done? We've made things more flexible using blended learning and flipped learning and online and active learning in classes, but do stuff online. So they've gone from a more structured environment to a less structured environment. And have we done the right things to help students to navigate and make the right decisions with that flexibility? I'm not so sure. Right. So there are questions there, I think, around this self-regulatory piece that I think we're going to have to grapple with as well. So all of this, in my mind, underpins the kind of longer term problem that we have in our curriculum and in our assessment. Right? We need to think about what these shifts are in our relationship to knowledge, to knowing and to being in the world uh, that we then need to align our curriculum and assessment approaches to. And as I said, some of this was a lot of this, frankly, we're still trying to figure out. But for me, that gives me a sense of where I think we need to head with all of this. We're going to try and capture this in a book. Um, it is forthcoming. Don't hold your breath. <laughs> we've got a lot of work to do and there are a lot of things happening. So we've pushed this out a little bit to make sure that we've got a fairly good sense of uh, where we are with AI as things start to settle down a little bit more because we know that we have gone through these cycles of hype and then despair and then hype again. Maybe we're about to go through despair again. We want to try and get a sense of what the patterns are through all of that. And that's something that we'll hopefully have um, available in the next 18 months or so, fingers crossed. Um, so we are trying to pull all this together in, some, in a resource that will be helpful for people. Okay, so before I um, finish off, uh, in the spirit of the episodes that I've just presented to you, I would like to thank my cast and crew. And there have been a lot of people involved in the work that I've um, presented here today. And I just wanted to say thank you to them. And thank you again for the opportunity to, to be able to speak. I hope that was interesting and useful. I know that it was partly speculative, but I think once we, uh, now we're in a position to think very carefully about our acute problem, we also then need to start, need to start thinking about where we're going to go beyond that. So thank you. Um, I post a lot of stuff to my LinkedIn, LinkedIn page. Um, so if you use that QR code, which we're all very familiar with now, um, you'll be able to access that. Thank you again for the opportunity to, to speak today. Cheers. Thank you, Jason. That was outstanding and very thought provoking. Um, before we open up for questions, may I ask the first question, if that's okay? Look, it seems to me that we're heading back to almost this concept of an apprenticeship model that is probably going to work best. But how do we do apprenticeship and relational learning and teaching at scale, which is the key issue we're facing as educators? We want to embrace our students and take them on our journey together, uh, but at scale? How? Yeah, such a great question, Patsy. I, I actually did um, 
I kind of second guess myself about whether I should address that directly in here because this question comes up so often, understandably. I, I think, I, I don't want to give a flippant answer to this, but I think part of the solution here is also embedded in the problem and that I think the kinds of tools that we are seeing emerging with artificial intelligence also will help us if used in the right way to overcome that problem of scale. Now, what gives me some confidence that that might be possible is that my colleague, Jacqueline Broadbent, who I've mentioned and who I'm, I'm working on that book with, she had 1800 students and she was very careful with her teaching team. She didn't do it all on, on her own to use technology in ways to help facilitate two things. Firstly, self-regulated learning. So it was really focused on helping students to understand their own learning processes better. But secondly, the whole philosophy underneath her approach was around relationships. So using the technology not to sideline her and her teaching team, but to help amplify the impact that they could have through the relationships that they have with their students. That's not easy. I'm not suggesting for a second that that's easy, but what I think her work and others, she's not the only one who's been able to pull this off. I think what that shows is that it is possible at scale if we think about it the right way and we focus on the right things. Um, how we get everybody on board to do that, again, is something I think is going to take some sort of collective effort. Uh, shout out to the Accord and whether or not we might actually get a National Learning and Teaching Committee that might facilitate such things. But that's the Jacqueline's example is one that gives me some hope that technology is part of the answer here as well as part of the problem. Uh, but we've got some work to do to figure out how that might work across every discipline, every institution, and so on. Sounds great. So the whole idea of maybe streamlining to one or two ways of doing rather than bombarding everybody might yep. be the way to go. Yep. So questions, anyone in the chat, if you've got anything to ask um, Jason or if you'd like to turn your mics on, please go ahead and do so. Just waiting for some questions to come through. I have one, Patty. Uh, yep. Jason, I think the idea of AI literacy as a learning outcome is a really important one. And I'm wondering whether you think that's part of the curriculum, which is obviously new, needs to happen in a discipline by discipline kind of way, or whether it's something that the university should be considering um, the equivalent of information literacy library training that all students come to our courses with this base understanding that we then work on from a disciplinary perspective. Thanks, Jenny. Hi, nice to see you. Um, nice to see you again. Um, I, look, at the risk of sounding like somebody who's in a school of education, I kind of like the Venn diagram model, the TPAC thing. And I think this is a really good example where my sense is it's probably a bit of both. And I think that there are some generic aspects of the way that we understand and work with these technologies that are worth everybody just knowing and being on the same page about. And look, I'm sure the library at UNSW is like our library. They're really on the front foot with this stuff in terms of figuring out what those components are. And I, I certainly think it, it's worth us thinking about how we can integrate that. However, by the same token, I think there are going to be some aspects of the interactions that we have with these tools in specific disciplines that are going to be really critical for those disciplines to think about. So for, again, I'm gonna be selfish and think about my own students. There are some aspects of AI literacy that are gonna be really critical for them to know, but they're very specific to what it means to be a secondary teacher, you know, in the 2020s, 2030s, 2040s, that are not necessarily gonna be covered by a generic approach, but might build on that more generic approach. So to me, I think it's probably one of those instances where the best the best of both worlds is probably what we want to aim for, because the risk, of course, on the other side is if we spend too much time on generic, almost transferable things in our already overloaded programs, some of the other key messages might get lost in that. So focusing on the bits that really matter for a teacher or a psychologist, that seems to be the, the right fit for me. Thanks, Vince. Thanks. Thank you, Jenny, for that question. So any other questions? I can't see anything coming up in the chat. So if you'd like to turn your microphone on, please do so. Got a hand up from Andrew. Andrew. Uh, thanks, Patsy. And thank you for the presentation, Jason. Uh, just, a, I guess, a question with what you picked up on towards the end with 
uh, upper secondary in particular going to a more structured framework and, and we understand the motivations behind it and pressure on teachers for ATARs, universities to more flexible. What are some methods you would suggest that could increasingly facilitate that bridge for students when they come out with that really good ATAR and then when they get to university and then there's a lot more flexibility? Are there any methods or any um, suggestions or papers that you would refer to? Uh, great question, Andrew. Um, it's... So this is something that I work on with my team, and this is a very one of the very specific problems that we try to address. Um, there are bits and pieces of the puzzle kind of all over the place. I think that historically there have been some really good attempts at addressing some of the issues that we're talking about here. And I think about some of the work that was done under the old Australian Learning and Teaching Council or Office for Learning and Teaching, particularly Alf Lizio's work out of Griffith, uh, which I think was really good at trying to understand some of those issues but looking at it very much from a learning perspective and how to support that learning process and that's not to dismiss the co-curricular things that we all do at our institutions mm -hmm. to make students feel like they belong we absolutely need those as a foundation so to me that work um Alf Lizio and Keithia Wilson and others um their their OLT reports around some of this are, are gold and they still hold up today the more complex and nuanced aspects of this is something that we're working on and we're starting with year sevens so we're going out to a school the week after next to understand what some of the messaging is to year sevens about how they learn and how they can manage their own learning then we're going to try and figure out what that looks like through their journey to senior secondary so that we can figure out okay where are the places where we might be able to get messages in that might particularly correct some of the misconceptions that are out there that we see about how learning works which I think are some of the hardest things that we find that we need to undo when they get to university. And what I mean by that is, for example, um, I'm confused, therefore I can't do it. No, 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 actually confusion is a really important part of the learning process and you can't have an aha moment if you don't go through being confused before that. So let's figure out strategies for you to be able to navigate that and think about a different learning approach that might get you past that moment of confusion. So it's a very different, I don't want to use mindset because that's been overblown, but we're trying to figure out what those threads of those messages are so that then we can think about the whole transition and not just trying to undo something that's been done previously in a one hour workshop during O week when they get here. Right. <laughs> so it's a, it's a complex thing, but we have that prior work, I think, to build on for that. Fantastic. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Andrew. Now that was very timely given that the um, HSC has started today in New South Wales and everyone's, trying to get the best data they can and then yeah. show up to university and then think differently. So, yeah, good yep. questions. Um, Chintaka, you've got your hand up. Thanks, Patsy. Um, first of all, thanks, Jason. That was a fabulous presentation. I loved almost everything uh, that you said there. Um, I, I completely agree about uh, the need to focus on learning as opposed to teaching. But uh, my question is, as facilitators of learning, um, the question is really about the role that need that we need to play in educating ourselves. So in the space of staff development and building our own skills up in this area, do you have any suggestions on ways forward, please? Great question. Uh, so one of the things I've found quite useful is that, um, and I'm not saying anybody here has this particular idea, but certainly there are you know many thousands of our colleagues around campuses that have a certain view about um, what their role is as a teacher and it's partly not surprising because it's hard-coded in our job titles you know I'm a lecturer I lecture I'm a professor I profess right so part of it is I think at the core who do we see ourselves as as educators and the more we can start to shift and think about what that looks like I think there was this kind of idea that we should all do active learning and therefore we should just be facilitators I think that undersells somewhat what our role should be so for me, when we come back to the kind of development approaches, and I've done a lot of this, it's less of my role here at the University of Queensland, but previously when I was at the University of Melbourne, I ran a graduate certificate of university teaching. And a lot of the work that we did was really about trying to think diff get people to think differently about what their role was. And part of it is about modelling. You know, we are experts and, you know, what does it mean to use expert knowledge in a meaningful way in the world? Um, part of it is also about then 
thinking about that, how that might play out in different ways in terms of the relationships that we have with students. So Patsy, your point about it being a bit more like an apprenticeship model, it does work on some levels. We don't want to be, so I, I used, I used to be a tradie, <laughs> interestingly. Um, and part of it was, you know, my uh, apprentices would come in and I'd fill in their little logbook thing. We don't want, quite want to go to that level. Yep. But I think a big part of it is that we really okay. need to think carefully about what our role is as as educators. And a lot of the development that we would then do can flow on from that. So if I see my role differently in terms of how I facilitate and do more than just facilitate that learning, I can then start to navigate, well, okay, I need to know more about this or I need to know more about that. It's a short answer to a complex issue, but it's hopefully something that's kind of, helpful because I'm constantly finding I have to do this myself what is my role here you know I'm not here to just tell the students this is how you teach I need to kind of model it I need to show it and I need to give them a sense of that That's it's a good question really important thank you Chintika for the question and Jason for your response Alex I'll hand over to you for the last question and for you to close our wonderful okay. uh, lecture right. today thanks look I did a fabulous sort of talk Jason I I the question that I really sort of um, intrigues me is, for all of us, we all know what the world was like before AI, and and we've built this really complex disciplinary knowledge about things, and we've got critical thinking skills, so we can apply that to AI output. But we've got these sort of kids in Year Seven who are going to have AI switched on before they've even seen the the structures of the discipline and critical thinking. Is there any work yet? been done about how do we actually imagine that sort of whole way in which learning occurs it's a that's a great question alex um I, i'm going to show my bias as a psychological scientist here but i think for me the more things change the more we need to start with what we know isn't changing so i always like to go back to my touchstones and i don't think this is just a disciplinary thing because i've seen that this has been useful as a way to help others navigate these kinds of changes memory is still memory, you know, attention is still attention, right? So what do we understand about these processes and what that what might that tell us about the interaction that students might have with technology beyond that? So human computer interaction, I think is a really important kind of fundamental piece in all of that, because I think then that starts to give us some clues about the ways that we're going to see those relationships change over the coming years. Um, I, I, I don't buy the digital natives kind of argument in this, but to your point, Alex, you're right in that we're all going to be using these tools. So we probably need to also start to think about how we learn from what we're doing ourselves, how we learn from each other. And increasingly, I think a key part of all of this has to be us working more across the different education sectors to try and get a feel for how this is happening with students so that we can all adapt collectively to this. And that's obviously easier said than done. But I think we probably haven't taken those opportunities with some of the technologies that have emerged in the in the past. So we think about the panic that happened during the pandemic, you know, oh my God, online learning. Well, we've been doing online learning for 25 years or more at that stage. Like why hadn't we picked up on more of of that kind of history than and sort of run with it? So to me, I think that the the answer is collective action to this. If those year sevens are starting to do that stuff now, then let's work with the, the secondary schools and and try and get a sense of what that looks like so that we're better prepared and that's part of what we're trying to do but yet that's not easier again it's easier said than done right and often it takes money that we don't have well that's that, what, a, what a beautiful segue to to help me finish this all off um the plea for money and look uh, <laughs> I just wanted to um, say thank you for um, a fabulous um, lecture. Um, as as Chintaka said, they, they are the best lectures when you agree with everything somebody says and you just sort of in the background cheering. I think it, it was a, what I really liked was um, the, the balance between um, despair and hope, I think was was right. Um, we, we I think hopefully are all leaving slightly scared, but not overly sort of de depressed and, and in despair. And, and there's lots and lots that we can do in terms of um, new and interesting ways to configure the way we think about learning and the way in which we think about teaching. And, um, and I think, and the other thing just as a, Sort of personal aside, the thing I loved the most was the number of references. I just love it when there's more reading that you can follow through and 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 go to. So, so it's a teaser really for the whole um, body of research that that exists around this. 
And we, you know, here uh, going into next year with a really, really strong sense that fixing, um, fixing is one way to describe it, but improving and um, elevating and rethinking the whole way we assess our students and the whole way in which we think about learning um, needs to change and needs to improve. And I think what was really important in, in your talk was that it's not just the assessment, it's more about the learning. The assessment is really the assessment of the learning. So we, if we can understand how people learn and then build AI into, into that, then um, we're, we're 90% of the way and then the assessment is easy. So I think it's it's a really fantastic corrective to, to that immediate jump to, oh, I've got to change my assessment. In fact, actually, let's start with thinking about how people learn. So thank you for the talk. It was fabulous. And I um, hope we can all sort of catch up in, in the future. That's great. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Patsy. Merlin. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you thanks, so much. Jason. Thanks, Alex, Patsy. Thanks, Laura, for organising it. And thanks for all the people yeah, who came. Thank you, Laura. Terrific.